Artivo Bice. Close enough, Shelly. I'll, I'll accept anything. I, I didn't hear that. I'm sorry. Oh, I hope my audio is working. Yes, it is. Okay, there it goes. Sorry. It's my end because it says I should stop streaming video. That's why. So it's it's my end. So we want to say a quick hi to you. I'm going to go ahead and um, I have to stop broadcasting my video. But we're going to go ahead and begin so you can hear from our wonderful authors here um, and read more about them as well. One of the great things about um, our authors today in the panel is they're going to share with us why they blog as authors, which I think is very exciting because this is something above and beyond. This isn't something that they're required to do. It's something that they took on themselves. Not only do they blog, but they also microblog. So you'll find them on Twitter as well. And you can connect with them. And I think that's really quite amazing. Just to introduce our panel really quick, we have Barbara. And she's coming to us today all the way from Japan. She's taught both English and ESL in the US and EFL in Japan for more than 25 years. She earned her BA from Western Oregon University, her master's in TESOL from Northern Arizona University. She's conducted workshops throughout Asia, the US, Latin America, and she is the co-author of the best-selling Young Learners series, Let's Go. Um, she's also the founding member of the Jolt Teaching Children Special Introduced um, Interest Group, and her motto is, always try something new. These days you'll find her at ITDI and her award-winning blog, Teaching Village, which is one of the blogs that I started on um, and really connected me to teachers worldwide. So I really appreciate that she gave me the opportunity to write for her blog. And she gives lots and lots of teachers as well. Then we have Luke Mannings. And I'm sure you know Luke as well. He's an award-winning author, trainer, and international speaker. In 2000, he co-founded the Dog Me ELT movement with Scott Thornberry and their book, Teaching Unplugged, which has won many um, accolades, awards, and has just done so much uh, profoundly for ELT and teaching in general. Um, it won a L10 in 2010. Since then, Luke has trained extensively. He keeps very busy, so I was amazed he was able to make it. Um, and in 2011, he set up the independent e-publishing collective, The Round, with Lindsay Confield. Um, their own book, 52, was published in 2012. And Luke, you just got great news because I heard one of your round books just made it to the Elton shortlist, which is uh, Jennifer Vershore's and Erske Kurigalu's um, book. Oh, so cool. congratulations. Thank That's you. very Thank nice. <laughs> and we have David De Dubo Weiss, which I hope I'm pronouncing right. <laughs> and uh, many of you know him. He is the founder of the ESL classroom that has literally um, thousands and thousands of English language teachers from around the world. It's been a great resource. He writes incredible um, pieces on ed tech. And best tool to do this or that. He's also a professor, an educational consultant, a teacher trainer, currently at the Schulich School of Education, I believe, in Canada. Um, well, actually, right now he's joining us from Guatemala, which is very exciting. Um, and Luke, Luke, are you joining us from uh, the UK or, or, or Spain or one of the many countries you travel to? <laughs> uh, no, I'm, in, I'm at home. I'm in London. Oh, okay, so London. Okay, great. So we're from three different countries. Um, and David has done really incredible things as well, um, author-wise. He didn't want to share too much of the ones, but um, he does have his free book available, The Unbearable Lightness of Being a Teacher. And one of the reasons we asked him was, and I'll mention this book because uh, Sylvia, um, and Sylvia Guinan from Greece, one of the other moderators and organizers of this conference, was profoundly impacted by Zen and the act of teaching, and she's going to be presenting on that. So um, I did want to mention that as well. 
I'm going to take my video off and begin asking them the questions, but I have put their Twitter handles and also things that they're known for and their different types of um, as well. So let's go ahead and begin, and I'm going to go to the next slide. And we may have some um, time for audience participation and asking questions. So just let us know inside the chat. So let's start by asking each of you, when and why did you begin to block? And we'll start with Barbara, ladies first. <laughs> Okay, well, I started in 2009, um, and I, I took Becoming a Webhead through TESOL EVO, and I wanted to try something new, and I think that it's really important that teachers always try something that makes them feel really stupid, um, and since I didn't know anything about anything online, I knew I'd feel pretty stupid, and I did, but one of the homework assignments was to start a blog, so um, I couldn't think of anything to write about that would be, you know, worth, that, that I could imagine people wanting to read. So I decided to start a blog and have other teachers write on it and try to give other teachers a voice because they seem to have so many interesting stories and, and not many people were listening to them, especially with the children's teachers. So anyway, but yeah, I started my blog for homework. <laughs> <laughs> And it's a great blog, so I'm glad you did your homework. They did it well. <laughs> Longest homework ever. <laughs> and Luke, why did you begin? And when? Well, well, I first started blogging a long, quite a long time ago, actually about 10 years ago, I think, um, because I was writing a column for the Guardian newspaper online. And uh, it ran as a column for, I don't know, a year or two. Um, and then they wanted it to be a blog. I guess blogging was becoming part of national newspapers' online offer at that time. And so it was turned into a blog, and it got very lively indeed, actually. It was quite alarming. <laughs> um, it was pretty much my first experience of, of uh, how uh, uh, upset people can get online. And um, there were some very uh, kind of um, angry comments, really which I had to restrain myself from replying to. And I used to email my editor and say, can I reply, can I reply? And he'd say, no, don't <laughs> reply. So, <laughs> so that's when I started. And I, I was blogging about uh, the ideas that we would uh, put together in Teaching Unplugged, but uh, at, I guess quite an early stage from my own writing point of view. Well, and it's really fortunate that you weren't unhindered by that, like it, that you still continue to write um, even with so many reactions. So that's that's really a, a incredible feat that you you did. Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not a bad thing if if ideas uh, please some people and upset others. It's not a bad sign, really, because it shows you potentially, hopefully, saying something different and something that might be worthwhile. So in some ways, it encouraged me that people uh, got across. Well, that's great. And David, um, why did you begin? Um, really, I was teaching in Toronto at Toronto District School Board and um, attending a lot of workshops and also, you know, giving some workshops. And it was initially just. Um, two things, to share resources and ideas with uh, my fellow colleagues, and then really also I was just curious about WordPress, and that was back in the days of you had to load it up on your own server and all that. Um, so I started that way, and uh, it's been a great journey. Now, each of you has a quite a following. Um, and, and Luke was talking about um, some of the comments earlier, so we'll start with him um, about the dialogues that come about this, because some are, are, are some. That's kind of the thing about interacting online. Uh, so much is said. So what was? Um, we'll start with Luke, and then we can go with um, 
David and then Barb, what was your earliest post that generated the most dialogue? And if you can kind of tell us what was the stories and experiences behind that. Well, one, some of the earliest posts were, were on The Guardian, but more recently, um, I remember blogging about teaching unplugged in the context of technology. <coughs> Pardon me. And this was probably two years after teaching unplugged had been published. So we're talking about 2011. And um, there was a sense, I think for years, that using technology in the classroom and the idea of unplugging were incompatible, which is a, an understandable reading, um, if a superficial one. And so I started to talk, uh, and on one occasion gave a talk about using interactive whiteboards in class. Um, and uh, there was some quite lively response to this also. And so I think that's a blog post that I remember. But it's also a kind of, it's a blog interaction that I remember. And, and it was probably happening on Twitter. It was happening on my blog and a, on a number of other blogs. Um, and it became part of a conversation. I think that's one of the strengths of blogging is a medium, uh, is that very often the best blogs are a response to someone else's blog, or they are uh, a question. They're a way of starting um, uh, a conversation between many educators. I think that is an interesting point to point out, because I do notice a lot with especially the English language teaching community that many will will hold different conversations about the same topic. And it's all, it kind of feels like one big conversation that's kind of gone longer. So. It's, it, it is great to see a lot of people's different opinions on their blogs. Yeah, I think that's right. Too. And I, th I think given that the overall scope of our conversation today, I think it's worth pointing out that, that uh, you know, microblogging and blogging go hand in hand, um, and that it, it's, I think it's hard to operate one without the other. They can complement each other. Well, that's good you feel so, because I know some of the authors said that they didn't. So we'll get to that, the microblogging, blogging uh, debate here. <laughs> and uh, David, but was your post that generated the most kind of dialogue or, or a lot of meaningful dialogue that you remember? Um, one off the top of the head, uh, off the top of my head, was um, uh, in praise of the backpacking teacher. Um, conversation and it's continued on a lot of blogs and which reference. And I was out of memory of David Newman and he was uh, really pounding the pulpit for more qualifications of English teachers and really um, really saying that you know backpacking teachers really didn't have a place in the profession. So that really took off and um, I, I run a big LinkedIn group also uh, lately, and it's really the dialogue's really changed to the LinkedIn group, and that same question is always one of the big ones with like thousands of comments on our LinkedIn group. And what was your particular stance? What were you writing in in that particular post about? Um, were you saying specifically about the backpacking teacher? Well, first of all, I I, I, uh, I wrote about you know my praise for David Noonan, and uh, when I was a young teacher, a few of his books were just really uh, helpful in my own development. But of late, uh, this was back in probably two thousand seven. Um, he really got into this uh, stance about credentials and credentialism, and um, I thought. I was really, I'm really kind of uh, against that as an absolute and raising the requirements. I think with language, other than, um, which is different, teaching language is than teaching a subject. And I think backpacking teachers really have a great night and they really benefit students around the world. And uh, they're uh, a great engine and uh, a lot of us probably started there. Oh, then that is, I can see why that generated a lot of different responses, because I know a lot of people probably jumped and were saying, yes, go, you know, um, <laughs> don't anti-backpacking. So uh, thank you. <laughs> 
And uh, Barbara, what was your uh, one of your posts that yeah, generated? <laughs> Uh, did, did you want to say something else, David? Yeah, sorry, David. Sorry, there's probably a lag with me, so just uh, go ahead with your irregardless when I jump in. Okay. Um, let me see. I think that, well, most of my posts now are actually written by guest authors. And, you know, Shelley and David were both really gracious to write for Teaching Village way back when I was first starting out. And, and both, both um, of your posts did get a lot of, of interaction. I think of the ones that I wrote myself, probably the post that still gets the most links is the one that I wrote about what is a PLN anyway. And that was simply, I was so excited after the TESOL EVO, and I was writing about how fabulous the uh, PLN, I was just saying PLN, PLN, PLN. And then every once in a while I would say personal learning network, right? Like that explained it. And finally, one of the teachers reading, writing or reading my blog sent me a private comment because she didn't want to look really stupid and said, what is a PLN? And I realized that I was making some huge assumptions among the people reading my blog. And so uh, I wrote a post about what is a PLN. And that still is uh, probably the post that I find linked to in other people's posts the most often. And that was pretty close to the beginning. Here's a link. Um, I also, I wrote one, it wasn't that early though, about why I love teachers. Um, and that, that gets a lot of conversation still. But most of the, most of the interaction is actually on the guest author posts um, because they write about such interesting things. So, and they have their own networks that they bring you know, to their post on the blog. And, and in some cases, um, it's the first time they've ever written publicly. So it's it's really wonderful that they get, um, you know, the sort of affirmation of finding out that people are interested in what they have to say. I thought that was, I think that's a good point because I remember uh, Fabiana Castella uh, recently got uh, nominated for her post on your Teaching Village uh, for the teaching um, English and she I mean that's literally millions who come to see that so yeah. she was so excited and Fabiana is a, is a newer at blogging than you know a lot of his great posts that she wrote on your village and um, and it was just incredible that you know she, the teachers had that yeah. opportunity so another post uh, that um, Anya Mukhelak wrote a few years back was highlighted as um, post of the month from British Council and you know she doesn't have her own blog so she was really kind to to share her experiences you know with cra using cracks and things like that um, so yeah my my, um, my guest authors have had many more awards than I have <laughs> but I, I get to claim the glory because they're on my blog <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so now we're going to start with David. And David, um, and each of you, the question too, and then we'll go to um, Luke and then Barb. Um, what blogging highlights or moments um, would you like to share, like any anniversaries or um, anything that happened as a result, any awards or not necessarily awards, but maybe um, different things that resulted as a part of your blog? Um, yeah, I had to think about this one for a while, but um, probably I'm just going to um, opt out of this question in a way because it's really, for me, blogging's most, the highlights have all been the people. Well, I think it's Matt? Matt, are you there? Uh, face to face that I first kind of... I just want to mention was James. He was a backpacking teacher, uh, believe it or not. 
and uh, he would hit my blog all the time, and uh, I ended up meeting Steve uh, Hargadon through him because um, he was having the same kind of, uh, may I say, problems with this guy. And uh, it was quite an experience, and then we Skyped uh, jointly with him, with James, to kind of sort him out, and uh, realizing, uh, you know, he had quite a few learning difficulties, and uh, it all came together through both of our blogs, so, so that was kind of a unique experience. That's They're kind of like counsel. Well, it's good to point out things like that because I think that sometimes with blogging, it's good for people who are coming in the blog festival, and some of them are uh, going to be doing blogs, or some of them are new at blogging. That not all the conversations, or not everything, um, is so positive. You get these very unique experiences because we're having a conversation with people. So it's interesting that you bring that up, and how, and that's really uh, great that you were able to find a way to get together, and Steve is an amazing, incredible person, but um, that you both were able to take that conversation and move it to something like Skype, where it's, uh, you get to see each other face to face and, and, and kind of help someone like that. So that, that's a great highlight to share. Um, and Luke? Any highlights or moments you would like to share, Luke? Oh, I hope my system's not. Not. Can you ever you need to go and see if maybe Luke me? comes back? Have you got me now? Oh, okay. Oh, oh yes, Sorry. yes, we get you. <laughs> Sorry, that was my mistake. Um, what uh, what was I saying? I was saying that I'd like to highlight my most recent blog, which I'll link to in a second. But just listening to everybody, um, something that occurs to me, which is something I've discussed with, with other bloggers, which is that sometimes we can labor over very things that we feel are terribly important uh, and, and feel that we're going to deliver a kind of groundbreaking blog uh, but, but we don't get that many uh, comments or that many hits. But then we can sometimes then write a, a kind of throwaway piece or something that just feels like a bit of fun. And it gets way more hits and way more comments. So I think sometimes it's actually a good idea to, to kind of shake things up a bit and to allow ourselves as bloggers to be lighthearted at times. And very often it's actually what people want to, to read because they want a bit of a break. But I will highlight and link to my most recent one. Partly because actually it's a very serious blog. Um, and what I found most recently is that although I'm not blogging as frequently as I have sometimes in the past, um, that I'm using the blog in quite a purposeful way, which is to uh, almost as a stepping stone between training courses or between talks. Um, and so that when I give a talk or when I do a training course, my ideas develop. I then try and you know make sense of those ideas in a blog, and that in turn helps me to develop my thinking ahead of the next talk or training course. Um, and it, reading back, actually, ahead of today's event, my most recent blog, um, I, I felt that it had succeeded in saying something serious about our uh, about education and about ELT, um, and that it was a, a product of this process of talking, training, blogging, talking, training, and so on. Well, I, I definitely agree. I loved what you, and I actually found it through, I didn't find it through your blog. I actually looked at your blog because I found it on Adam Bills. And okay. um, he had quoted where you had said at your, um, in your plenary, and, and I tweeted that because I just thought it was so profound and I'm going to totally screw it up so you can go back <laughs> and say it, but it was, it was along the lines of, the, you know, uh, a kind of we're in trouble when the most revolutionary thing you can do as a teacher now is not teach to the test, and I, I just thought that, that that just really hit me, like those words I thought were just uh, really, um, and do capture what is happening in school. So I, I definitely do agree with this uh, oh, posting. Today. And I thought it was great too because you're one of, um, 
uh, you're with the round, and and you have this initiative with the round, with Lindsay, and um, it's good to have a, a voice that's kind of among the few that that has a presence that speaks uh, against these kind of big things like testing and uh, publishing and what it is, and not that it's all bad, but that you know there's got to be change. So yes, I I, I definitely like that post. <laughs> Thanks, you. And Barb. Barbara, sorry. Sometimes I call Ooh, Barbara wow. because uh, I know Barbara quite well. So <laughs> you know, it's it's okay. The only I, I, until I moved to Japan, I was Barb, and it was simply when I moved to a country where you know Barb and Bob sound like the same name that I switched to Barbara. So, <laughs> so with the, the Japanese pronunciation. Barb is a hard name, so Barbara is a lot easier when you can't do the R's. But you're welcome to call me Barb. Anybody who can do the R can call me Barb. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let me see. Highlights. Um, well, you have to remember, when I first started writing a blog, I, I don't really have an author blog, you know, to be honest. Um, I mean, I, I do mention that I'm an author on my About page because I, I don't want to pretend that I'm something I'm not. You know, and I don't want somebody to come out and accuse me of, like, acting like I'm not an author or something like that. But it really wasn't something that I wanted to make a big deal of simply because I didn't know what I was doing. And if I really messed up and did something really stupid or put my foot in my mouth, I wanted it to be, you know, Barb Sakamoto who did it and not the Let's Go author who did it. So... Um, I, I didn't actually start out trying to do an author blog, but because of that, I didn't really think anybody was reading it. Um, I was quite surprised to find out that I had a big readership. I never really paid attention to analytics or anything like that. Um, I just wanted to try to give teachers a voice and uh, to try to you know, encourage teachers who were also just getting online to to share their ideas with other teachers. But I think, in the process, hmm, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say that with your blog, uh, that's one of the things too, and I, I think you bring up a good point because a lot of teachers and um, who are starting a blog, uh, they they that you point out about the audience because analytics sometimes will show you that people are reading more and even though a lot of times people argue against these um, types of platforms that give awards I remember at the beginning just like you that the only way that I knew that I had a big readership was because of these award things that they only go by analytics so they kind of let you know and I know for you you had several of them that, that came about um, and that teachers, you know, that focus on getting so many comments and things like that, that that's not a true indication that how many people are reading your blog. No. Well, and actually, I was really surprised. Um, one of the posts that I wrote, oh, probably in 2011, I guess, um, about it was just a, a fun piece, like Luke was talking about why I love teachers. And um, I made a distinction between teachers with a, a small T, who just do the drum teachers with a capital T, who have an avocation. And um, I, I got a, an email from a magazine in the UK asking if they could reprint it. And I was quite surprised that, you know, I, I think I was under the assumption that, you know, my family, and maybe the people who'd written for the blog and probably my editors were reading it because they had to. Um, so it was, it was quite interesting to see that there was a, a wider readership at that point. Um, and then I, I think Teaching Village was the TEFL net site of the year. Um, what was the other? There was some other, I think, it, like Language Lovers or something. There were a few awards that kind of were, you know, popularity votes and, and people, um, it, and while I personally wouldn't care if um, Teaching Village had a huge readership, I'm, what I'm most proud of is that most of our readers are actually ESL or EFL teachers, um, and a lot of them are non-native speakers, and a lot of them teach children, and so 
I still I'm I'm quite surprised when I go to like Indonesia or China or Ecuador and teachers will come up and say, Oh, I love your blog. Or when you know, teachers will say, Well, put it in your blog because like I'm not on Facebook and I'm not on Twitter. And you know, sometimes we start thinking that blogs are almost superfluous these days because everybody's either on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn. And yet, I have some people reading the blog where that's their only connection. Uh, so it, it's quite humbling. But yeah, I, realizing that I, uh, that things were getting reprinted was kind of a surprise. And actually, I was just going to say that uh, right now, that is quite humbling to hear each of you who's a award-winning, well-established author with, you know, mm -mm -mm, a huge audience and that you are you your reactions to blogging are not like that your reactions to blogging each of you, you you during the questions you've shown you know how quite humbled you are when you have the readership and and so I think that's that's something that's really quite uh, nice oh and I can see uh, David now <laughs> I was going to say, I think that, um, you know, I can, I would say over, over half of the posts to village are not written by me. And so whenever I have um, a teacher, whenever I get an award, it's not me, right? Um, I think there's bloggers from 37 countries now, something like that. And so I feel like a steward more than, uh, you know, an, an author. <laughs> I mean, I have a stuff for all the author stuff, and um, the blog itself is is much of a, much more of a stewardship. Well, we're going to well, that I think that's a good, nice way to look at it. We're going to go ahead and uh, switch to microblogging, um, and since Luke kind of um, started talking about the microblogging and blogging, how they go in hand. Um, we'll go ahead and talk about that. Uh, when and why you decided to microblog, and on, we'll go ahead and go with the next question after that, which is what microblogging highlights would you like to share, or any thoughts about microblogging in general? Where are we starting, Shelley? Uh, we're talking about uh, when you, you and why you started. Who are we starting with? with? You, Luke. Oh dear, I thought so. Okay. You. <laughs> um, that was what I was afraid of. Well, uh, I think the I think the key thing for me about microblogging, and I started on Twitter around the time that a lot of colleagues were, and I, I'm trying to remember if it was before or after um, Teaching Unplugged was published, around 2009, 10, I think. Um, and I think the key thing about it then was that it was about joining a conversation. It was about finding out what other people um, uh, were saying, what the other conversations were. Uh, so it's not just about kind of getting your point of view across. I think microblogging is very much about sharing and getting involved in a conversation. And so the whole etiquette of microblogging is actually not just about being polite. It's about the benefits to you, which are to, you know, to be grateful when somebody shares something that you've written, but to make sure that you share other people's things as well. So to me, it's, it's, a, it's a way to, to quite quickly uh, and in a very energetic and, in a sense, quite demanding environment, find out what the big conversations are. Do you think for you, um, when there hasn't, you talked about earlier the post that um, you thought would generate that huge conversation and they didn't. Um, yes. Do you think that microblogging, when you when it carry when you carry the same issues on the micro on microblogging, that you get that kind of audience interaction you were hoping for? Yeah, no, I think I think one of them. I mean, you know, I said something in the chat box earlier in response to Barbara, and I was saying that it's important not to get too hung up on analytics. Um, one of the key ideas behind blogging is that everyone has their own voice. That's what Barbara said about her guest bloggers that. We all have something to say, which is going to be slightly different to what anyone else has to say. And that's one of the wonderful things about being able to blog. Uh, and as I said, one of the things I think to bear in mind is that if somebody 
maybe somebody you don't know or somebody you wouldn't get a chance to speak to reads what you've written, then that's that's an amazing thing. You know, it's already more than you reading it in, in your own space. Um, but at the same time, um, and I think, I'm not sure if Divi is talking a little bit about this, the public side of blogging, just getting up the, 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 the kind of courage in a way to write a blog. And I don't think that goes away when, when you become better known. I think it's still there. Um, having the courage to say something, to say it publicly, it, it takes a lot of energy. And then if you don't get anything back, it can be discouraging and dispiriting. So it's all very well for me to say, well, one reader is better than none. But hey, you know, it'd be even better to have 50 or 100 or more. And so that's where I think Twitter can be very nice um, because and Facebook, because it allows you to get some instant feedback and maybe get a bit of love back from the community and see that, OK, five, six, ten people are reading what you've written, that it was worth it after all. And Barb, what has been your uh, experiences with microblogging? Well, I started out on Twitter. It was also homework from TESOL EVO. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really hadn't done anything online except I, I think I had Skyped with my daughter. I hadn't used online to connect with anybody I didn't already know, which is fairly typical for teachers my age, I think. Um, and the first time I opened a Facebook account was for my high school reunion, um, you know, like the 25th high school reunion. And the first thing I did was go over and, and friend my high school daughter, saying, guess whose mommy's on Facebook? Um, <laughs> she was thrilled, as you can imagine. But it took me a while to see the value of Facebook, to be honest, although I use it probably more than Twitter these days. I think what I've noticed most about Twitter is that you know, it's a really effective platform for teachers who are apprehensive about sharing. Um, you know, some of the things that happen on Twitter, like ELT chat or ed chat, um, are, are, are really fast paced. And they can be a little bit intimidating to, to participate in if you're not really confident in your English. But just interacting with teachers. Um, Facebook and Twitter are actually really comfortable because it's only 140 characters or you know it's only an update and they disappear into the, the ether after a while and it doesn't have to be immediate so you can take your time. Um, so I actually I, I used to get all of the best resources from Twitter links shared on Twitter and that was uh, it was such a rich resource when I first got on it and started using it. So, I, I like both of them. And I, I have some teachers who are, you know, are just on Twitter and some who are just on Facebook. And there seems to be some geographic distinction between two. I mean, if you, most of the teachers I know who are not confident in their English, they're on Twitter. But they're not tweeting in English. Um, and, you know, 140 Chinese characters is a long conversation versus 140 characters in English. So I don't blame them for using their first language. Yeah, exactly. I, I think that, um, that that can be very difficult. I've tried doing that in German, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, let me go on to the next uh, question because I think we might have lost David because he's having some problems. Um, and this is kind of a question. <laughs> uh, but do you prefer one over the other? And if you don't...
Um, this is about the community. It's about people contributing and participating in whatever ways that they're comfortable with um, at that point in their development. And so the people who are reading and sharing, perhaps making the odd comment, are just as important as the people who are tweeting a lot and blogging a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's all a shared enterprise. And so I think one of the advantages of Twitter is, is, you know, it's like putting a toe in the water. It's just trying out some thoughts, trying out your own voice. And so, I, I, you know, for that reason also, I think it can be a nice uh, stepping stone towards. So one final point is uh, the first blog I set up was called 140 Words, I think, I seem to remember. I oh, remember I, that. Uh, I was trying, it's out there somewhere floating around in space. Um, <laughs> uh, and the idea there was to almost, I mean, it was a bit of a, a play on words and the idea of 140 characters in Twitter. But I think there's an interesting thought behind it, which is that blogging doesn't suddenly have to be this great leap uh, into, you know, 500, 600 word pieces that you can start your own WordPress site, uh, and which is far easier than it was when uh, in the early days David was describing. And you can blog quite short blogs. You can blog a link. You can you can blog an image, and and you know it, it doesn't have to be a kind of oh my goodness now I've got to sit down for three hours and and write a lengthy text. I'm going to go ahead and um, share Tom's question because I think it's a very good one, which is what about the visual part of blogging, video and images? Because I know that uh, for for you, uh, I remember you had to read. Uh, an almost minimalist approach, in a way, to your your blog. Uh, it looked very different. I remember when I first saw that 140, that it was it was so different than other blogs I had seen. Um, did you want to respond on on that, the visual aspects? Um, not immediately, except to say that I think they're very important, and that I think it is worth spending time on the right images. Um, and again, you know, WordPress is is uh, an, uh, is an easy. I mean, there are other platforms. It's the the best that I've used, um, and it's easy to make things look good. Um, and I think images and uh, other people have used video blogging much better than I have, or much more. And I think it's great. And Barb, what would be your um, response to Tom? Because I know that with your particular ones, you do do a lot of not only video and images, but you add multimedia. I've seen a lot of times where you've had your voice threads and student examples on your blog. Um, and yet there's a lot of people who have a lot of time um, accessing it when I do. So that's something to keep in mind. I think that um, Blogging and microblogging are really very different. Um, microblogging is a conversation. You know, blogging is a long-term conversation. Like a post that I put up in 2009 can still get a comment in 2014. And I think that's the biggest difference, it, for me at least, is like I can I can pretty much ensure that teachers will get comments because. Teaching Village has a really supportive community. And if it's on the blog, then there's a permanent link. And people can always find it, and it shows up in Google search. Um, if it's on Twitter, it's safer. If it's on Facebook, it's safer. But you have to be friends with that person to see it. Right? Or you have to see it immediately, because it disappears. And so, you know, I, I know some people who, who pretty much blog on Facebook with notes. And I always feel, I, sometimes I write to them and say, hey, would you consider putting that as a post on Teaching Village? Because I think it's really good. And that the, if it's only on Facebook, then the only people who will ever see it are the people that they're friends with. Where if they put it on like, Teaching Village, then not only will it get seen by the Teaching Village, you know, like subscribers or the people I share it with on Facebook or Twitter, but it'll show up in searches down the road when people do keyword um, searches that, you know, the blog will pop up or I can recycle it and share it again in the future. And, and a blog has a permanence to it that um, 
which is what scares a lot of teachers about trying it, but it it hangs around. So you can find it later where Twitter and Facebook disappear. But they're wonderful for starting and they're wonderful for sharing. And you realize that a lot of the stuff that does get shared comes around again. So if you miss a link, you'll see it again later. Um, and of course, if you are trying to, like I use Twitter quite often as a, like a teacher's lounge, where if I'm having a question about a class or I want to find some kind of resource, the best place to ask it is on Twitter or on Facebook, simply because there's always somebody awake and there's always somebody who can answer where if I send it out as a blog post, um, it'll go out in, you know, like you share it immediately on, on Facebook or on Twitter, Shelley, and, and it will go out that way, but then it won't go out to subscribers until the next day sometimes, and, and the response is much slower. So if I need an immediate response to something, there's nothing like Facebook or Twitter. But if I want a permanent link, there's nothing like a blog. I think that gets back to the different reasons why people blog, you know, and I knew that some people blog because uh, I know there are those out there who want a presence and want to market stuff, but I think a lot of us, and especially each of you, is a reflection of that. It's more of a conversation, greater conversation, to get that thinking out there and, that, and, and to get those ideas. And um, I've seen it as kind of your working ethic as well. It's, it's how, like Luke was saying earlier, how um, he comes, he, his presentation, and it, it becomes part of that itself. Or it could even become part of the writing process in many aspects. And I know from my experience that my blog often shapes, you know, what I'll say in a, a keynote or a talk or write about myself, um, which I think is really wonderful. And David is saying some great comments about reflecting and how we take the time versus not reflecting um, as much and being more spur of the moment and microblogging. Um, so I'm going to ask you each, uh, again, what would you recommend, uh, and once again, uh, David is answering and responding in the text because Paradise, Guatemala, is um, is <laughs> a little bit low of an internet connection there. But um, would you recommend authors blog? You dropped out, Shelley, for me. See. Yeah, she seems to be uh, out. She'll be back. In the meantime, there's some comments in the chat box. Maybe you'd like to uh, relate you? to them. It looks like video is dead. Is my audio also dead or am I still no, live? Quite well. You're okay. Barb. Okay, you can hear me. Can you see me? We see you. You see dead? yourself. You can see me. I just can't see myself. Yeah, because you're frozen. <laughs> That's okay. It must okay. be cold there. Okay. <laughs> I'll turn off my video then if it's only a picture of me frozen. I'm in Kyushu, it's not that cool. So th there was a question earlier. English tuition was asking about the speed takes it out of blogging. It is all just sharing. I mean, I think that's been a message from David and Luke and me. And you know, regardless of whether you're sharing it on Twitter or Facebook or a blog, um, I mean, sharing is the main point. I, I, I think it was one of the reasons that you know, I started blogging and then um, it's one of the reasons I got involved with ITDI um, and a lot of the same you know, authors who had written on Teaching Village became ITDI associates because that was just the kind of people they were. Um, and that was why Chuck started the ITDI blog 
was to have more in-depth conversations. But, you know, it's, it's all sharing. Yeah, but the point is sharing for what purpose? It, you know, what's behind the sharing? Sorry for being practical, but um, why share? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question, Nelly. I think, um, I think that there's as many different reasons that people share as you have authors. I mean, there are authors who blog to promote their books. Um, and that's not a bad thing. I mean, it's, it's just it's one reason. Um, there are authors who share to develop material for their own writing. Um, I think I don't know any authors um, who share like just to make themselves more famous or anything. I, it, I at least none of the people I hang out with. Um, I think that in in my case. You know, I had a fair amount of, um, well, not a fair amount, I had some recognition as an author. And so rather than, I, you know, I didn't really need a platform to talk about what I thought as an audience, you know, as an author or anything like that. So it, it, what, in my case, it was a chance to use whatever recognition I had to shine a light on teachers who weren't getting the recognition I thought they deserved. So that was the main reason that, that I started blogging. Uh, David mentioned um, try to be. I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting, I'm sorry if my question uh, came out that way. I'm not suggesting that anything is negative or positive. Trying to be, no, it's just being. You know, uh, I think it's a good point that David made about uh, sharing thought. You know, that's why we write. We write uh, because we want an audience in most cases. But when I say, why do people blog? There are different reasons for blogging. There are business reasons, uh, learning. I mean, people do it for self-development uh, and for other development and uh, to share. I mean, whether you make money or not is not a bad thing either. And I don't think that uh, there's anything wrong with making money uh, if you spend a lot of time blogging and people offer you money to do it. So um, there are lots of reasons. That's why I ask, uh, what is your reason for blogging initially? And uh, does it change? I, yeah, I wouldn't know. I've never been paid for blogging. So. Well, you can be paid. Just let me know, and I'll I can get you a paid blogging um, gig if you're interested. Yeah, you know, I, I've turned down ads on Teaching Village. I've turned down sponsorships. I I say no to guest bloggers who are asking so they can get a link to their own blog, um, mostly because I want to keep the focus on the teachers who are sharing and if I I just I don't feel comfortable um, it's just me I just don't feel comfortable you know taking money for basically with other people's work you know that's I think that's a whole um, you know philosophy or attitude to money and shooters to money but um, yes yeah, some people feel but that no, um, just, uh, there's something wrong with it if uh, it has to do with teaching well no, uh, actually I think it's yeah, I think it's fine to make money <laughs> okay but not I mean, there, are, blogging. there are there are um, places there are places within ELT where you pay for a blog, much in the same way as you would once have got paid for an article. I mean, if you write for the British Council's um, uh, Learning English, or I think that's the current name website, um, then you it's essentially uh, an article, and there's a comment thread which you then are um, uh, you know invited or expected to to get involved with for for a period of time. So. Uh, you know there are there are ways to get paid for it, just as there have always been ways to get paid for writing articles. But you know it's a balance, as always, of, of choose, sort of choosing your um, 
financial battles. I don't know. You know, you you, you might if, if you said I, I have to get paid for everything I blog, then probably you won't blog very often. Um, but I, I don't see why anyone should turn down the opportunity if it's there. Right. So uh, if I think, no, I'm just kidding. Um, we're going to have to I end. Sorry, Barbara. Uh, sorry oh, to okay. stop you, but we've got a couple of minutes yeah. until the next session and we need to get there. If uh, And you're all invited. Um, Tom has added a link. Uh, the conversation, I think, uh, should go on. I mean, it doesn't really end here. And uh, blogging about it is one great way. If you could uh, join us in the link that Tom has added and so we can continue the conversation, that would be great. And uh, join us in the next session with uh, Nancy. Nancy was here. Um, Nancy Zingrona is going to be talking about connecting. Blogging as a way to connect. All right, so uh, join us there. Thank you, everyone.